Now, this evening in particular is a special reason to celebrate South African wine. Uh, many of you may already know that last night the South African government lifted the most recent prohibition, which was banning the sales of alcohol and crippling the wine industry there. So even more, I am delighted that I've been able to open three South African wines this evening. I've got a red from each producer and I'm delighted to be able to support SA tonight. So Joe, without further ado, I think it's time to hand over to you and good evening. Thank you very much, Anna, and welcome everybody and a huge welcome to our three speakers who I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to introduce, which I will do very briefly. And as Anna said, it really is, this is a celebration of South Africa with, uh, with three leading producers and, you know, some, some badly needed good news, which will give you all added energy that you need ready for the harvest, I hope, uh, which is, is almost upon you. Um, so we have three speakers and they're each going to talk about, uh, give a bit of background to, to what they do, who they are and what they do, um, each with a couple of wines, um, which happen to be featured in our current fine wine list. Um, and we're going to, uh, so I'll, I'll introduce, first I'm going to introduce Samantha O'Keefe uh, from Lismore, who is going to speak last. Uh, Lucas van Loggenberg is going to go second, um, but we're going to start with Peter Allen Finlayson of Crystallum, who began, I think, began Crystallum, I believe, in 2006. We first bought uh, 2009 vintage. We then had a little gap, and then we bought consistently from the 2013, I think. The volume seemed to be getting smaller and smaller, which is very frustrating, although I have just had my offer of the new vintage through, so that's good news. Um, so Peter, a big welcome. Normally I would see you at, uh, in your cellar at, at Gabriel's Kloof, your, your day job. I, some, some members may not necessarily know that you, you, you wear two hats, um, but it's a pleasure to see you on screen if I can't see you on person. So over to you. Super, thank you so much, Joe. Um, and thank you to everyone that's tuning in. You know, it's, uh, it's been really tough. For everyone um, in South Africa, we just come out of our third prohibition, so we're feeling a, a you know a lot more cheerful about life today than we were three or four year, three or four days ago. But look, it's it's tough for everyone, and um, yeah, I think let's uh, not focus on that and let's talk about wine and let's talk about South African wine, and um, yeah, hopefully we can entertain you and you can learn something new. So. Um, Kristallum, as Joe mentioned, started uh, 2006. First vintage was 2007. Uh, was actually Sauvignon Blanc. Made Sauvignon Blanc for four vintages and then decided to focus only on um, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Um, Chardonnay and Pinot have become, I suppose, the, uh, the focus of the Himalayan Arda area. Uh, the Himalayan Arda is behind the town of Hermanus, one of the cooler wine growing regions of South Africa. And certainly, I think, particularly when it comes to Pinot Noir, one of the top regions uh, in the world. Um, you know, Pinot is, is famously fickle um, and needs a really specific set of growing conditions to work very, very well. And the Himalayan Arda is now mentioned with the, the top regions in the New World. Uh, people like Neil Martin, like Tim Atkin, uh, you know, uh, consistently, um, you know, review the wines um, as being, uh, you know, right at the top. We, uh, <clears throat> we started, like I said, in 2006, um, but my family goes a little further back than that. Uh, the Finlaysons were uh, first uh, made wine in South Africa in the 1950s. Um, my grandparents started what is now known as Hartenberg Wine Estate. Um, they unfortunately lost that. I think that was in the, um, uh, in the 70s. Um, my uncle went to Blauklippen, my father went to Boschendal, and then my father was the first winemaker to be at Hamilton Russell Vineyards. And that's how my family ended up in Hermanus. So uh, my father spent 10 years at Hamilton Russell Vineyards, and then he started Bouchard Finison in 1989 with Paul Bouchard and a group of shareholders. Um, he unfortunately sold his shares in Bouchard Finison um, in the late 90s, early 2000s. And that's why my brother and I, uh, we didn't get involved in Bouchard Finison. Um, but rather started something new. I, I tried, you know, my best to get out of the wine industry. I, uh, I ended up studying philosophy and economics. Um, I did a bit of drama at a stage and was involved in a 
in a long running play. Um, but yeah, just happened to uh, to not be able to really, you know, um, pull myself out of it completely and ended up coming back to it um, and in incredibly happy that I that I did. And, uh, you know, fortunate to be in a position where I was able to to start that something from scratch. Um, and I think start something at a time um, where there's just been so many other great producers. You know, I think you, you look at just Lucas and and Samantha here. Um, and in the last 30, 30 years, uh, you know, people in the UK have been fortunate to have the new wave events and fortunate, I think, to see many of those new producers being picked up by importers. Um, you know, we, South Africa, I think it was two days ago, we celebrated the, uh, the foundation of the, or the, the day when the first wines were made, um, sort of 360 years ago. Um, you know, so we obviously have a very long history of making wine, but um, in a sense, our, uh, you know, the history of winemaking in South Africa is very, very new. Um, and it's only in the last 30 years that I think the industry has really, really started to show its potential um, and show what it's capable of, you know. And I think going from an industry that was, that was pretty conservative, pretty stuck, uh, you know, in its, in its ways um, and really not making much of an impact on the global stage, um, to an industry that's that's seen as one of the most exciting on the globe, you know, and uh, you know, every year we're seeing new producers coming out, and uh, yeah, it just really is such an absolute privilege, um, you know, being part of this this group of uh, of winemakers, and um, yeah, let's let's hope we can continue that, and uh, yeah, hope that uh, you as wine drinkers, um, you know, are, are still excited about South Africa and in 20 years time. Um, so Kostanum, we, as I said, we focus on Chardonnay and Pinot. We do multiple Chardonnays and multiple Pinot Noirs. Um, the two wines that we're going to be focusing on tonight are the Peter Max Pinot Noir, the 2018, um, and the Agnes Chardonnay uh, 2019. So both of those wines are multiple vineyard blends. I think the 2018 Peter Max is uh, a five vineyard uh, Pinot Noir vineyard blend. Um, three of those vineyards, sorry, Four of those vineyards are in the Himalayan Arda area, and then one is in a small ward called Ilanskloof, which is behind the town of Fadiesdorp. I forgive you if you don't know where that is, uh, but that's about 50 kilometers from the coast and 700 meters high. So even though it's not in the Himalayan Arda, it's, it's a fascinating site um, and provides an incredible um, component to the Peter Max. And then also a, a, we make a single vineyard wine from that as well. So the Peter Max is really... Um, I think our almost our vintage expression uh, wine, uh, because it's it's kind of an, an average over uh, multiple vineyards. Um, the 2018 is, um, yeah, I think a, a wine that that I'm incredibly happy about. It was a, a fairly warm and dry vintage, um, so we increased the whole cluster components of the wine. I think it was up up at sort of uh, 40 50 percent. Um, total whole cluster in the percentage and during the warmer years we try and inc increase that whole cluster percentage to bring a little bit of a, uh, a fresher element to the wine uh, also find some some lighter fruit component that come into the wine um, you know we, we may not have the quite the vintage variation that one would get in uh, in colder parts of Europe but we certainly do have vintage variation um, and I think my fellow uh, winemakers will agree with me in that um, you know, it's, it's all about adapting to the vintage. Uh, you can't have the same recipe um, going through every vintage. It's just, it's just not going to work. You're not going to get the, the potential out of it. Um, if you look at that picture there, you can see the predominant soil types that we work with. So all five vineyards that I worked with would have that soil type, which is uh, shale and clay. Uh, you can see the looser soil structure at the top with a bit of rock in it. And then it gets into that orange kind of iron rich band um, and into the slightly paler, slightly almost pinker, um, sort of heavy, heavy clay underneath that. Um, and what that clay gives you is water holding because we're a drier area. Um, Pinot doesn't work in, in soils that are too free draining, too sandy. Um, you really need that water holding capacity, uh, you know, to give those vines access to water going through the dry months. Um, and that's something that the Himalayan Arda has got plenty of there. There's a couple of uh, areas in the Himalayan Arda where there's a little bit more granite, but it's all over a clay base. Um, and it's, yeah, if we didn't have that, we wouldn't be able to make the wines we make, which is, uh, which is fantastic. Um, then the Agnes Chardonnay is the other wine, um, that's named after my great grandmother, um, Agnes Floyd. And, uh, yeah, she was a, a, a very, uh, very powerful, very strong world 
woman um, and uh, yeah, we uh, feel that the wine, uh, you know, that she deserved to have a wine named after her. She was sent to South Africa on a boat as a 14 year old to be an au pair um, on her own. Um, there are many theories about why she was shipped out, but uh, I won't go into those right now. And uh, it's yeah, once again, our uh, sort of multiple vineyard wine. Um, also five different vineyards, three in the Himalayan Arda, one in Elgin, and then one inland high altitude. Um, a really, really lovely vintage, I think 2019 across the board. We had better rains in the winter of 2018. So lovely freshness, freshness in the wines, lovely purity, um, dry, cool, leading up to vintage. Um, yeah, so I think it's, it's certainly one of the best vintages of the Agnes uh, that I've produced. Um, yeah, and in terms of, uh, you know, winemaking philosophy, uh, you know, it, it's a very, very simple one. Um, we do natural fermentation of everything. We use sulfur, but, um, you know, as, as kind of low levels as we can get away with, we filter when we need to. But um, we have, a, and I think the other winemakers, you know, have the same uh, focus here, sort of a, a natural approach. Um, but I'll always make clean, you know, beautifully kind of um, terroir representative wines. And, you know, and I think to do that, you need clarity in the wines, um, you know, and to do that, you can't be too dogmatic, uh, you know, about what you do and what you don't do. So we work as naturally as possible. Um, you know, the sulfur levels are all below the organic threshold of sulfur levels, uh, but it's, it's really, really important that those wines are healthy and that those wines um, you know, are crystal, crystal clean. Um, and I think that's the best way to represent the, the beautiful terroirs, um, you know, and the incredible sites uh, that we work with. We own uh, one of our vineyards now that we work with. Uh, we're planting another four hectares. That site is about three kilometers outside of the Himalayan Ridge Ward. So three kilometers further along from Creation Winery, if you've ever had the pleasure of being out there. Um, but otherwise we work with growers. So we work with nine different growers where we contract the wine, the, the viticulture, um, everything's done as we would like it to be done. Um, you know, so we act as if they're, uh, they're our own vineyards. Um, and it's something that gives us flexibility in terms of site, in terms of terroir, um, you know, something that I think uh, works really, really well. Um, it's been a massive positive, I think, for the South African wine industry that winemakers have looked beyond the estate model. You know, the estate model certainly has a place um, you know, it's, uh, it's important to, to have control of your vineyards. Um, but I think in the past, it also limited people's thinking about where they could get grapes from. Uh, you know, and uh, I spoke about the last 30 years and the, the foundational changes that have happened in the industry. And a big part of that is winemakers realizing that they can go, you know, to another grower and they can say to him, listen, I, you know, I think you've got fantastic vineyard or I think you're an incredible site I'd like to plant there you know I think that it can really help and, and supplement what I'm doing um, you know and the focus has, has therefore shifted to site you know has therefore shifted to you know put the effort into the vineyards put the effort into growing um, you know and then the winemaking part of that's easy you know and I think taking the focus from the off the, you know the winemaker and uh, and placing it on the vineyard um, you know, we, we're blessed with, uh, you know, these incredible, incredible sites in South Africa. Um, and I think we have to show those off, you know, um, Samantha's going to talk about her, her property. Um, uh, but yeah, you know, little nuts that she decided to plant vineyards and, and, and make wine out there, but these incredible schisty soils and, um, yeah, it really, really just is the most incredible site. Lucas works with some of the, you know, great granite sites in, in Stellenbosch and um, yeah, just a just an absolute uh, pleasure. Let me just see if uh, anything else. Um, yeah, focus. You know, I think it's uh, it been pretty clear what my what my focus in, and I think that's uh, gives you a, hopefully a fairly good idea of Chris Stellum and and what I do. Absolutely, that was fantastic. Thank you. I've got. I'm bursting with questions, but I'm going to hold them because I can see there are so many questions coming through. One, they may well be covered, um, yeah. but uh, we'll, we'll see how we go. So I think if we leave questions till the end. Uh, so what I will do now is oh, sorry, just, very... just really briefly interrupt, Joe. We have had a couple of members, I think, who would like to understand slightly better just before we move on exactly yeah. where... Um, Chris Dullum is based, um, perhaps a little bit less understanding of Himalanada. And I believe yeah. that Jill behind the scenes is pulling up a Wines of South Africa map, fingers crossed, 
Otherwise, I am happy to give it a go myself, but just an overall map. I know later on we've got a few more. Um, I will share screen now. Apologies, members, this is a web page. But this, uh, if you don't mind, Peter Allen, just quickly talking us through um, just whereabouts you are here. So, I'm, so I believe, yeah. Yeah, so I'm based, if, sorry, I, I, difficult to see exactly what's going on there, but I'm based in Bot River. Uh, which is sort of right over there. Um, and that's, as Joe mentioned, my, my day job or the other project that I'm involved in is Gabriel's Clough, um, which where I've been involved in since the middle of 2014. And I make all my wines there. Uh, incredible, incredible cellar and facility to use. Um, but most of my vineyards are in the Himalayan Arda, which is just behind the town of Hermanus. So if you see there between Hermanus and Caledon, uh, the valley, Himalayan Arda Valley runs in a, in a pretty much a straight line, uh, you know, between those two towns there. Um, and that's where most of my vineyards are between sort of uh, 20 and uh, and 30 kilometers away. But if anyone would like to visit me, um, I am based at the Gables Clough Wine Estate. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt, but really appreciate that. Thank you. And I'll let you continue, Joe. Okay. Yeah. And I, and I would add actually that the, um, if you're heading out in that way, the, the Gabriel's Cliff cellar is very easy to spot. It's very well signed. Um, and you're, you're basically sitting, both you and Sam are within the, the wider area, which is called the Cape South Coast. It's a relatively new kind of umbrella term, which covers a lot of those cooler climate regions down there on the, on the South Coast. So that's something that people will hear as well. Okay, so let's move on. I'm going to introduce Lucas. Um, now, Lucas, I first met, uh, I think, well, it was, it was right at the beginning, actually. The first time I came to, to see you with, with Richard, Lucas works with a, a great friend of the Wine Society, Richard Kelly. And we went to this, to your Devon Valley cellar. Are you still using the, the, the place in Devon Valley? Uh, uh, we've, I've been fortunate enough that from our humble beginnings that we were able to go to a bigger cellar just outside Paul, just between okay. Paul and Stellenbosch. But uh, I will never forget the first day I met you because when Richard told me that he's coming with a fellow master of wine, uh, I was quite nervous because, uh, um, yeah, anyway, I think it turned out well at the end of the day. It certainly did, and that was, it, well, I look forward to seeing the new place, but but actually I loved the old place, which was basically, to, to those of you who are, who are listening, it was a farm shed, really, wasn't it? You know, and there yes. were, there were, I mean, it was always, it was very well organised, but you didn't have a great deal of space, It can't, and you're a big man, it can't have been a very easy place to work. <laughs> um, and I came there that first time knowing that I wouldn't be able to buy the wines, but I have to say it was one of those experiences where it, it sometimes tasting wine is quite an emotional experience. And that's, that's what it was like for me. There was something absolutely, well, really special about, about that first visit. So when we could buy, when there was a little bit more volume, we started buying and we've been buying a little bit since when you can spare it. Um, I didn't manage to get any either of the wines that, 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 that you're going to touch on later, but I just happened to have a sample uh, that I needed to taste. So I'm actually tasting your rosé. Um, and the reason I want, one reason I wanted to mention it is that, that you have, a, I think all winemakers uh, know the value of backstories, but you have particular strength in the backstories to your wine. So this wine is called Break a Leg. Um, which I guess takes you back to um, less happy times, really. But, <laughs> but anyway, Lucas, welcome. Um, over to you. Yeah, thank you for having me. And if I can just start off just being able to do a, a, a virtual tasting with Sam and Finn, which has been like massive heroes of mine. I remember the first time I tasted Sam's view near, I was like, how is someone out of country impossible to produce something like this? Um, and then just Finn's ballsiness. I love whole bunch fermentation. Uh, the, how he does whole bunch fermentation with Pinot Noir. Where when we were at university or studying winemaking, it's you kind of it's like a dogmatic 
approach, like he said, like be clean and pure. But I love that texture that he gets on his spinners with the whole bunch. Um, so I grew up in Rawsonville, which is in the Breedeclaw Valley. And for those that aren't familiar with South Africa, that's kind of like uh, the bulk wine production area. But there's some very good friends of mine that are um, starting to push the envelope of ensuring that they're making fantastic wines there. Um, and I grew up not in a, a wine producing or wine generation family. I actually sold secondhand cars for, for a year. And then I was lucky enough to get a, a rugby scholarship at Elsenburg and uh, went to go study winemaking uh, a few years after school. And then, um, yeah, I was lucky enough to go and work after Elsenburg at a, at a pretty um, successful winery called the Eichs in Tolbach. And then after three years, I just had this urge to go and explore the world. And um, I went to the States. I always admire the States because one of the best things I've ever learned, it's, it's kind of easy to make proper wine because you need great fruit. And, um, but a sold wine is the best wine. And for me, the Americans are fantastic marketers in wine. And I went to the States and after two years, it was my dream always to do my own thing. And um, so I came back and I married my girlfriend back then, my wife now, Roxanne. Um, and then um, we decided one year to go to France. Um, and while I was in the States, I had these unbelievable friends who played on Wall Street and they had this amazing collection of wines. And I will never forget the first time I tasted Claude Rugard was an old vintage um, and coming from university you kind of get taught what Carbonet Franc is and that and and I tasted this wine and I was like this can't be Carbonet Franc it, it had this unbelievable perfume and refined Pinot structure almost like and so we went to France and we went Burgundy and all those things but uh, we ended up in Loire before we flew out in from Paris and um, we ended up at Domaine de la Chevalerie in the Bourguet area. And the winemaker, Stephanie, opened up a, a 2005 um, uh, Carbonet Franc, which was unbelievable. And then um, we walked in these granite mines and she said, I'll open up the old vintage. And she opened the 89, I think, um, which is one of the greatest vintages in the Loire Valley. And I will never forget the day that she pulled that cork. I could, I was probably standing five meters away from her, but I could smell the perfume and that pure carbonate front fruit from that bottle of wine. And I turned to my wife or girlfriend back then, and I just said in Afrikaans, I'm going to resign when I get back home. This is what I wanted to do. And um, so, yeah, we came back. Um, 2016 took a lot of guts and... Uh, financial strain and we started our own little business from Locher Mac Wines in a little shed in the Devon Valley area in Stellenbosch. Uh, I will never forget, I think we did five tons, which is 4,000 bottles um, of our own wines. Uh, yeah, there's Devon Valley on the map. Um, not that we use grapes from that area, but due to the Karina's friends, uh, they had a little uh, cellar there or a shed that had a, a license and all the paperwork. Um, yeah, and uh, we've been blessed ever since uh, Richard Kelly came. He was actually the first uh, professional person to come and taste the wine uh, or wines from barrel. And uh, it's all thanks to Chris Allied Bucci. Um, I had a bad left knee accident sport wise and uh, Hence the name break a leg from the wines, but I'm not going to get into that tonight. And um, Richard came to one day and I was really nervous because he's, um, I don't know if you guys know Richard Kelly really well, but he's, uh, he has an unbelievable good palate and uh, he's not a big talker, but he writes like a million tasting notes about each sample that he tastes from the barrels. Um, and he 
tasted through the wines and he told me, oh, someone selling your wines in the UK. And I said, no, not yet. And he said, well, if they come asking for your wines, tell them you're already taken. Um, and from there, we just grew really humbly small lots, uh, bit by bit. I'm a massive law fanatic. So we focus on Shannon and I love Cabernet Franc. We do a bit of Syrah and then the, the break leg Blanc de Noir is, um, a wine that has done really well for us. So I think the wines we're tasting tonight is the Trust Your Gut uh, 2018, which is one of our two Chenin Blancs that we're doing. Um, the name Trust Your Gut, um, I think Sam and, and Finn will agree with me. For me, the most difficult part of making fantastic wine is deciding when to pick your grapes. Um, so we don't try and use a lot of fining agents or commercial yeast or stuff. Um, and you basically have a 36, 48 hour picking uh, that window to pick the grapes, to capture that perfect freshness and stuff. And I think any, any profession can relate to the term uh, trusting your gut, because the more experience you get in what you do, when those difficult decisions come, you just go and look into your inner instinct and you know what, what decisions to make. Um, and uh, Trust Your Gut is for me, uh, we do a single vineyard Shannon called Camaraderie, which is minuscule amounts. But Trust Your Gut is for me, in the end, the perfect Shannon Blanc from South Africa. <laughs> Excuse me. So we, the 2018 vintage, I think we did two and a half thousand bottles of, of that wine. It's 76% uh, from the Perberg, uh, the Swar plant. Um, those vineyards are planted. Those are the vineyards uh, That's the Polkadrai vineyards. Um, the previous vineyard, they, the picture they showed were from the Paderberg. Uh, so the Paderberg vineyards are planted on this really soft um, decomposed granite soil. Um, yeah. So those decomposed granite soils, there's the vineyard. <coughs> those vineyards don't normally have the fruit expression from Stellenbosch. They just give this beautiful structure, elegance to the wine. And then, uh, <coughs> sorry, the, the Polkadrai fruit is planted on proper granitic soils. And uh, all the Shannon, is fermented in old French oak. Um, and then we bottle it the end of end of November. We leave it on the lease. We don't batonage. Uh, South Africa is going through a massive drought period. So you can ask the other two guys. We get massive fruit concentration on our wines. Um, yeah, and that's it. And then the second wine you guys are having is uh, Breton 2019. That's probably my blue eyed uh, boy or girl. Breton is the old name for Cabernet Franc in the Loire Valley. <coughs> and uh, I think the name um, is massively due to Richard Kelly. So 2016, we did a, we did a, a bit of a Cabernet Franc, which was just a ton. And uh, due to the, the style that I wanted to do, we didn't do a lot. And uh, Richard tasted the wine and he's like, what are you gonna do with it? I said, no, I'm gonna bottle it on its own and trying to think of a name. And he said, well, why don't you call it Breton? And he told me about the whole Loire history of the, the name and the variety. And um, I took a chance. I told Salvas I'm gonna call it Breton and they agreed with it. So Breton is uh, free Cabernet Franc vineyards from the Polkadrai area planted on granitic soils. <coughs> yeah, South Africa, like the law, doesn't have a lot of chalk in their soils. But the one thing for me that Carbonate Frank always has is focus, energy, and almost that pureness to it. And uh, all three vineyards are around the Polkadrai area. Um, I'm one of the crazy few people that do 100% whole bunch fermentation on Cabernet Franc. So two of the three vineyards are 100% whole bunch fermentation ferment, fermented. 
and then it's aged in big 500 liter French oak barrels. And um, yeah, carbon, I think I'm gonna quote a, a line from Rivet Arts, who's one of my few good friends that make world-class carbon franc. Carbon franc is the only variety that has free fruit uh, flavor, flavor profiles. It has fruit and spice like all the variety, other varieties, but it has this herbaceousness. And I think when people hear herbaceous, they think of green tannins or green flavors, but it's like walking in Tuscan and you're smelling that wild sage, uh, rosemary, thyme. And it's just those three together. And when those wines age, it loses that herbaceousness and then it's just spice and fruit. And in South Africa, we love lamb. Um, which if you guys know my physical nature, you can see there, I love uh, food and wine. And uh, you know, uh, Breton with a nice uh, lamb shank or a, a leg of lamb on a Sunday roast, uh, it just works so beautifully together. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm really sorry I'm not tasting the uh, the Breton. I share Richard's love of Cabernet Franc, I must admit, but um, I will I will get myself a bottle. Of um, okay, let me now introduce Sam. Um, and if, if, if these two guys haven't been around terribly long, um, you know, Sam less so, uh, some of you may, may, may or may not know that Sam actually came over from California looking for a complete life change and certainly found that um, in the little town of Grayton, which I'm ashamed, I've, I've, ashamed to say I've never yet managed to visit. Um, but I'm sure you're going to, going to explain to us where it is and we're back down in the Cape South Coast region. And I remember we first met, it was actually Peter Allen introduced us at a trade tasting in London. It was when Woza did their um, Beautiful South, pairing up with, uh, with some of the other Southern Hemisphere nations. And Peter Allen kindly introduced us as then. Um, we, we only started though with the, uh, what did I say? We bought, yeah, from 2017, yeah. Um, and so, and we, we re-bought the Viognier that some of you, I think, uh, are enjoying now. Um, and we also have a Syrah, which is the one wine from the, from the list that I do happen to have in my glass. So, um, I'm looking forward to hearing, hearing more about that. So Sam, welcome over to you. Thank you. Um, it's so nice to be with everybody. The UK is definitely my favorite market and I really appreciate everyone having us tonight um, and to be with Lucas and with Peter Allen and with Joe. So yes, I'm born and raised in Southern California. And um, as a student, I actually sailed around the world as my semester abroad. Um, and in Brazil, we picked up Archbishop Tutu in 1992 and his wife, Leah, and we sailed across the Atlantic to Cape Town and played ping pong and he lectured to us for six days. And, um, and in February, 1992, I, I arrived in Cape Town Harbor and it was a really incredible time. It was a very tumultuous time in South Africa, but um, Archbishop Tutu really imparted his love for this country um, into all of us. And, and after my time here, I called my father and of all of the countries, that I visited sailing around the world, I said to him, someday I'm going to live here. And, um, and I went back and as young people do, I ended up working in, in television, totally off course. I, I was studying development. I expected to work for the World Bank um, and, and I ended up at a television network. And so at 29 years old, I quit my job and packed my flat into a company that would ship overseas and, um, and left for Africa. Long story short, I ended up back in South Africa. I um, got married, had a baby, and needed a reason to stay. And so I went looking for an answer. And one day I drove down a very long, dusty road out of a village called Grayton. Now, Grayton is an hour and 20 minutes outside of Cape Town. It's about a 40 minute drive from Bouchard Finlayson, for those of you who know the iconic properties of Hermanus. If you see Hermanus there in the map, there's, there was, it's now paved where creation is, 
But if you drive up that dusty road, what used to be a dusty road, it's now paved straight across the end to straight into the mountains. There's a little village of population 2000 people um, called Grayton. And you drive through Grayton and back out into the mountains and the 325 meters, um, there was a muddy old dairy and a bankrupt apple farm called Lismore. And, um, and you know, I couldn't afford a wine farm, but I could afford a muddy bankrupt dairy. And so um, I bought this farm, I built that house. And um, I planted 36,000 vines in a place that nobody had ever planted vines before. And, um, and in 2009, Grayton was declared a wine of origin because of what I had done there. So Grayton is now an appellation within the South African Wine and Spirits scheme. Um, and it's within Cape South Coast. So for those of you who know my wines, and maybe those of you who don't know my wines, almost all of my wines usually are either Grayton, which effectively is Lismore, it's an estate wine, or it's from the Cape South Coast, which is our cool climate region, as Joe mentioned, basically from Algen all the way to Neisner. But, you know, very few vineyards predate 40 years ago. And, you know, it's really an area that when South Africa was free after KWB disbanded to plant in places that weren't controlled by the cooperative and by the government, um, people started just pioneering and branching out. And obviously Peter Allen's father is one of those pioneers, but there's a lot of pioneers of, of, of known and, and lesser known regions, but effectively it's South Africa's cool climate area. Um, so yeah, um, a couple of years into that story, my ex-husband left, so it was me and my two little boys and, and we carried on. And Lisbon produces now about 70 to 80,000 bottles of cool climate wines. Um, I don't only make them, I don't only grow unique wines, I, I produce them in a somewhat different style for South Africa. Like for example, I have a barrel fermented Sauvignon Blanc that's made in a really oxidative style, not your fresh and fruity new, um, new world Sauvignon, um, really textured. And, and that leads us to the wine that, that we're showing tonight, which is the Age of Grace, um, because I treat Viognier the same way. And you know, when I planted grapes on this farm, Sauvignon Blanc was really trendy. And so the consultants were like, you should plant 25 hectares of Sauvignon Blanc and thank heavens I didn't. Um, but instead of that, I planted quite a bit of Chardonnay, um, five hectare, actually 5.2 hectare of Chardonnay because I'm Californian and you know my accent will sell millions of bottles. And this was the key to my business plan right there. You know, I'd make this big buttery over wooded like huge Chardonnay and everyone would get it, like California, big wine. Um, but you know, when, when we did the terroir research, what we actually realized is this wasn't the site for that wine. And, um, and you looked and it was a really, it was one of the coolest sites in South Africa. It had a diurnal temperature shift, basically warmer days, but really cold nights. It, it's an apple and pear valley. And so, you know, apples need warm days and cold nights in, a, in order to color. And it looks very much like the Northern Rhone. We have significant summer rainfall. And, um, and as we took down this list in 2003, what Lismore actually resembled more than anything was the Northern Rhone. But in 2003, the Northern Rhone wasn't trendy. Everybody was planting Bordeaux varieties and drinking Bordeaux varieties from Sauvignon and Semillon to, to the red Bordeaux. And, um, and the Swartland Revolution hadn't happened yet and the run was not in fashion. But because of this comparison, we, plant, we planted a little bit of Viognier and a lot of Syrah, taking a chance. And um, you know, we come to about 2015 and Lismore, the estate now what is called the Estate Reserve Viognier, um, really made its mark because it had a super unique terroir expression and it was like nothing South Africa had ever grown. I, I'm, I'm humbled by the comparisons to Condrio, but I actually don't think that the Lismore Syrah tastes at all like, I mean, sorry, Vignet tastes at all like Condrio. I, I think it's quite smoky and, and really dried apricot and has a, has a really distinct, distinctive sense of place. So in 2015, we had a severe drought because I also dryland farm. If my life wasn't hard enough as a single mom, I decided to dryland farm as well. 
Um, and, and so the yields were, were really low. And I went looking for Viognier grapes. And I thought I might find something similar to my terroir. And I found a vineyard in Elgin, same clone, the, the Rhone clone, but um, a bit different soils. It was on rose quartz soil. So I brought the grapes in. I fermented and, and treated the fruit exactly the same as the Lismore Viognier. And what I got were two completely different wines. They were both so beautiful, but they were very distinctive. They really each had its sense of place. And I didn't quite know what to do now. And, um, and I actually called my friend, Peter Helen Finlayson, and he said, we'll release another Viognier. And I was like, but you're Peter Allen Finlayson, you've got five Pinots, but I'm not. And I can't release two Viognier's, who would do that? Um, but he encouraged me to do it. And so the Age of Grace was born. So the wine of tonight is called the Age of Grace. It is a wine that is traditionally made from Elgin fruit um, on rose quartz soil, made oxidatively, sometimes made with an, a concrete A component, um, aged in older, larger oak. Um, and, and the reason it's called the Age of Grace is because I'm Samantha Grace O'Keefe and it was really a turning point in my life and my business in 2015. And so the Age of Grace was the next chapter. Um, and, and it's actually been a really great one and it was really great advice. Um, so thank you, Peter Allen. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. And then the, going to the other side, to the Syrah, the, um, the estate Syrah also is very distinctive. The fruit from my farm grown on dry land farmed shale soils. You know, um, the first few years that I made this wine, I was trying to make a South African Shiraz and, and the Lismore Whites had really made their mark. Everybody had, had really recognized the unique terroir, but I was, I was trying to treat the fruit like, you know, kind of 2009 South African Shiraz and this was 2006, seven, eight, and nine. And, um, and it got to the point where it, it, it didn't really have its own story. It wasn't very special. And, um, and the baboons would come in and take it right before harvest. And, and I was pretty much convinced that it was time for me to pull my Syrah blocks out. And in um, and 2014, I started with this idea in 2012, I started working with whole bunch fermentation. Um, but by 2014, I really leaned into it. And, um, and all of a sudden I was, I was showing really what Lismore was made was meant to be. Um, it was this floral, bright, low alcohol wine that that was like nothing South Africa had ever grown, and and I couldn't believe I'd been missing it for so long. And so, luckily, rather than pull out the vineyards, I started leaning more and more into the style. I went to the Northern Run. I really started to understand and appreciate um, again more more floral, bright red fruit texture. Um, you know, minerality in, in wine, minerality is an overused word, but I think in, in some Syrah in cool climates, you really get that like wet pebble stone, that, that licking a wet rock, you know, feeling. And, um, and so Lismore Syrah, the, a lot of my, the, the, the particular fruit goes into the estate reserve. But, um, but again, I went back to Elgin, which is a similar climate, and I started buying in fruit. So the 17 that we're showing tonight is 50% um, is from Elgin and 50% from Grayton. And it's 40% whole bunch fermented on the skins and the stems for a full 28 days, and then fermented in older wood in different format barrels um, from 228, 300, and 500 liter barrels. And, um, and I really think I've sort of started to just sit comfortably in a corner of South African Syrah that there aren't a lot of producers sitting in where it's it's a real embracing cool climate Syrah. It's again, red fruit rather than blue, purple or black. It's textured and crunchy, it's floral. I hope you get a lot of floral elements. Um, you know, Lucas was talking about the Garrique. I think that um, when I make red wine, I want it to be colorful. I don't want it to be monochromatic and just red or blue or purple. I want you to get varying colors in your mind and, and dried lavender and bouquet garni and, um, and, and potpourri. And, and so, yeah, that is my philosophy of Syrah. And, um, and yeah, that's what I do. 
Um, that was wonderful. Thank you. A, a super introduction. I, I'm going to have to polish up my wine tasting note writing because I, I love the way you described that wine. <laughs> um, now, as I said, I've, I've got loads of questions that, that I could ask, but I feel sure we have lots and lots, Anna. So I'm going to hand over to you. Um, certainly do. We've got absolutely masters of questions. I think the best way probably to do it will be to ask a couple of general questions and then to go through perhaps in the order again, as there are some questions for the individuals as well. Um, I did just want to mention before I crack on to the questions that I'm really pleased to see not only lots of members have all of or some of the wines open tonight, I should say, and there are lots of members who are already big fans um, with plenty of stories in the chat. Um, Peter Allen, there are members in the chat who are currently working out which contacts to get in touch with because your wines have sold out on our website. So <laughs> there are people um, working that out. Lucas, there are loads of members sharing really lovely stories about tasting with you in the shed. Um, and Sam, we've just had one member, Andre, say that your wines are so good that if you if, no, if somebody hasn't tried the syrup, then they need to beg, steal or borrow a bottle. So <laughs> clearly plenty of members with decent experience um, and, and love of all the wines. Um, so as I said, I think what's probably easiest is, easiest is if we start with um, some kind of group questions where we can all comment and then we'll go through each individual producer. Um, I'd like to start with a question for Joe, actually, but I think it will be uh, something everyone can answer from Peter. Um, is it becoming increasingly difficult to get a decent allocation of South African wines like these? And then why is that? So are prices high, are yields low, or is it a competition thing? So Joe, perhaps if you could start, but I'm sure um, each of the three might have their own thoughts on why it can be quite hard to get hold of these wines. <clears throat> Sometimes it's frustrating that we can't get more of, of certain wines. And there are sometimes wines that I have the privilege of tasting that I know I can't buy at all. And, and yes, that's frustrating, but at least I have that privilege. And, you know, one day maybe that, that situation will, will, will change. Um, I think we're very fortunate at the Wine Society because we, we can be flexible. So if someone's only got a very small quantity, we can buy a very small quantity and use it for one specific purpose. Now, what we have found of late because sales have been going bananas um, is that sometimes uh, uh, what we think will last the length of a list uh, hasn't done. So it was quite soon after the fine wine list was released that, that Someone was on to me saying, oh, we've sold out of the Peter Max 18, Joe. Can you can you write a note for the 2019, which luckily we happen to have in stock? Um, so we do that when we can. Um, but yeah, sometimes it's 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 uh, it has to be our best guess as to how long something will last. Um, we try and, and uh, support producers over a period of time. And sometimes that then secures you a little bit more. But at the end of the day, these guys have a huge fan base all around the world to satisfy. So we, we take what we can get of this good stuff. Um, and yeah, I would just say, if you, if you, if you find that you like the wines, then grab it when you see it. Um, and I suppose the other thing to say is that when we don't have, have the wines, the wines from producers like this will be sold by really good independent merchants so if you're anywhere near a good independent, then that's another another place to look. Right, I'm going to shut up now so you can uh, pass that question on. Yes, yeah, so maybe if we can start with you, Peter Allen. Do you? I'm guessing stock is a, an issue with yours. You did mention very low quantities produced. Yeah, we, we've fortunately, um, you know, especially in the last kind of three, four years, um, you know, the wines are all allocated up front, um, which which is a great position to be in, you know, and I think. Um, you know, I think I speak for everyone when I say that the temptation is, th is there to kind of go um, with something like the Peter Max and go and buy from new growers and ramp up the production, you know, but I think the, the, the most important thing for us is just to kind of stick to what's made the brand successful, um, you know, and, and that's kind of working with the right vineyards, working with the right growers, um, you know, and, and if, we, if we try and scale, we try and kind of 
grow too quickly, we'll, we'll lose a lot of what makes the wine special, you know? So, um, you know, we, we are, I think, very fortunate here yeah, that, that we do have over, over demand for the wines, which is fantastic. Um, but we, we all do realize how important the UK market is. And it's, it certainly um, still is my biggest market. And I, I think the other two uh, probably right up there. So we, we do try and look after the UK market as, as best as we can. Thank you. Lucas, anything to add to that at all? Yeah, it's, <laughs> for me, the most difficult part of our years is finalizing our allocations. And uh, and then all the people that we export to or that buy us our wines are, are really people with great palates and that are great business people. And especially like Finn said, and I think Sam will agree, the UK is by far our biggest uh, market, and with dealing with Richard Kelly, um, you're walking on thin ice. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's it's especially the beginning vintages like the 2018 Trust Your Gut that you guys have. I think there weren't a lot of cases going to you guys. So, um, I think we're really blessed that uh, the further along we go. Um, we were lucky enough to make more wines and um, and obviously there's a, a lot of countries in the world that are drinking fine wines and uh, but like Finn said the UK will always be a, a soft spot for us and uh, it's a shame that we couldn't visit you guys last year and um, but anyway yeah no it's um it's it's great making fantastic wine, but without the, the the end consumer, we wouldn't be sitting here chatting to a computer and with people drinking our wine. So wonderful, thank you. And um, Sam, anything to add to that at all? Do you have any particular struggles getting quantities to us in the UK? Um, no, definitely. I mean, look, you know, what everybody needs to remember is that we're small business people and we're not good at this. Okay. So everybody gets mad at us because we don't have a lot and we're farmers, you know, if we knew how to manage like things like allocations and spreadsheets, we would have been accountants and it's, it's really hard, you know, I mean, I, we're small businesses. So in the beginning, if anyone wanted to pay cash I'm like yeah and then someone comes back to me and say but you promised me 50 cases like yeah but that guy wanted to buy it I don't you know I don't understand this allocation story I need money I need to keep my electricity on and I remember talking to a friend in Chattanooga who was like been doing this for eight generations and he's like Samantha it's a spreadsheet like grow up you know how do you you know get it together and, and, and in, I mean, in reality, because Lismore only has so much planted and because Grayton, you know, effectively is only me as far as commercial production is concerned, I had to go outside um, my area, but luckily Cape South Coast is, is growing such amazing grapes that that's the only way that I was able to increase production on certain wines. Um, so it's hard. And I, and I just think if people don't appreciate it. I think they think that behind the scenes, there's their teams and actually it's just us at our kitchen table, um, you know, knowing like Richard Kelly's about me or, you know, so and so like it, trying to figure it out, you're dividing sometimes the production, I mean, and I'm sure Lucas and Peter Allen and I have certain wines that are two, 3000 bottles, you're dividing that a, a, around the world. It's hard, but, but I mean, yeah, as they both have said, we, the, the UK usually gets first in. <laughs> so, so what you have, to, yeah, that was priority. We're all very glad that none of you are accountants. <laughs> <laughs> I think the the only thing that I would that I would add to, to those comments is you've all touched on the fact that South Africa's been in an extended drought. Of course, that has an impact on volumes. Unlike in Europe, you don't often get hit by frost, but you know, as 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 Peter Allen said early on, um, vintages do vary. So your volumes vary year on year. And uh, so if we need to step aside one vintage, we can do that as so long as you let us back in when, you know, when you've got a bit more to, to, to spread around. So, you know, that works for us. Thank you all very much. Um, so I have a question. It is a general question, but Sam, I think it'd be good to start with you, actually, if that's OK, because I know we have got some pictures. And the question is from Jordan Wiltshire, um, who has asked, what have been the biggest challenges of growing wine in South Africa? 
Now, Sam, you've got a particular story. We've had loads of members in the chat asking, would you be able to mention it? And I know that we've got some photos behind the scenes. Your particular challenge of growing wine in a very warm climate is incredibly real. So if you could kick off this question first and feel free to, you know, to dedicate a couple of minutes to it. I think members are really keen to hear about, hear about um, the rebirth of Lismore, I guess. Yeah. Um... Yeah, so after, you know, 17 years of um, building Lismore from an old muddy dairy in Chue in, into a wine farm that was really finally starting to work. Um, and I was more grown up and my kids were grown up and the, and the vines were, and I had a, a beautiful new cellar. Um, on the 17th of December, 2019, as many of you know, a fire came down the mountain and, um, and destroyed everything on the farm. Destroyed the, the cellar, destroyed the house and took about 40% of, um, of the vineyards. So in, in about an hour or two, it felt like, you know, a day, um, we lost everything. But, and, you know, we live in a world where um, before I even made it back to the village, um, evacuating to be given a <laughs> volume and a beer. Um, I had a call from the UK actually saying, I just saw on Twitter that, you know, Lismore burned down, are you okay? And I said, you know, I, I think one of origin Grayton has just been wiped off the map, frankly. Um, the next day when I, I went back with the insurance company, I was pleased to see that um, about 50% of the vine, 60% maybe survived. And, and that gave me enough hope um, to think I might be able to rebuild. And, and while I was reeling from the shock, the South African wine industry was all banding together and um, coming up with ways to push me forward. And, you know, um, the industry donated cellar space and grapes. That's my new cellar. That's the rebuild. We, we, we've just rebuilt it. Um, and they, so yeah, with donated grape cellar space, money, services, um, love, support, uh, just encouragement, um, somehow, literally, I didn't even, I had the clothes on my back. It's such a cliche. Um, my kids had the clothes on their back and whatever was in my, my vehicle. Um, we have, have just rebuilt the cellar. That's the new, the, the rebuild. It looks very similar to the old cellar, if any of you ever visited it, it's because it went up exactly the same. Um, but, you know, just over a year later, we will do 2021 in that cellar. So I saw popping up on the chat, um, someone asked the difference between the 18 and the 19. It's a very special story and I won't take up too much time, but, um, you know, the entire 19 vintage was destroyed of Lismore wines and the Age of Grace 18 was about to be sold out. And I have a friend who doesn't make, it doesn't really produce a, a well-known Viognier, but he'd been so inspired by my Viognier. He was constantly in the back of his cellar with like barrels and working oxidatively and, and sending me samples and all year long in 2019, he kept sending me samples of these barrels that of Viennia that he'd been um, trying to basically make a wine that that was sort of like mine, and um, and so when the cellar burned and, and they were excellent, and when the when everything was lost, he came to me about two weeks later and he said, you know, I have about three thousand liters of that Viennia and I would love to offer it to you. And, um, and I had other friends offer me barrel fermented Viognier. And, and so I basically blended with the help from friends, a Viognier. And that's why the front of the 19 doesn't say Cape South Coast or, um, or Grayton. It says a very special wine from South Africa because it's actually a, a project that me and my friends put together so that we would have a 19 to bridge between the 18 and the 20. And I think it's delicious and it, it very much has the signatures of Lismore wine. Um, it's textured, it's bright, it's beautiful. It has a slightly different terroir expression, but I, but I would never have put it into a Lismore bottle if I didn't think it, was, it wasn't absolutely delicious. And, and, it is, and it's full of a lot of love in that bottle. 
um, because it, it's really a, a project of, of me and my friends. So, so farming, so going back to the question, farming isn't for sissies, um, you know, drought and pestilence and, and the bank and, um, and all sorts of things are at your door, but um, you know, something catastrophic like a fire can come through and, it, and it only then are you really tested of, of whether you you really want to do this. And, um, and I can tell you that I never had a doubt after it was all wiped off the map that I, that this is what I do and I love it. And that I would somehow come back from it. But if it wasn't from the help of a lot of people around the world, but especially my, my peers and colleagues and, and a lot of strangers, and some of you probably watching tonight, um, I wouldn't be here, so thank you. Thank you, Sam. That was lovely. And I think a lovely story at this time about perseverance and resilience as well, actually, um, which I'm hoping that everyone has a pinch of at the moment. Um, Lucas, fires, et cetera, not the only challenges. There are day-to-day -day challenges too. I wonder if you could comment on a couple of such other South African growing, growing and production challenges, actually. I don't know what, what I have to add after Sam's... Uh emotional uh, thing um yeah it's i think you, you need a, a a great foundation base uh, especially with these things coming like the three of us where you don't have like um, many ge generations coming back from farming and stuff um, the great thing with me is um at the end of the day i, I told my wife when I asked her to marry me, I asked her, you can either get a guy like that has a medicine degree and he'll look after your health, but I'm going to give you a fantastic bottle of wine every day of your life on your table. And, and at the end of the day, for me, it's, I think we all just have to be positive. Like with Sam's story, uh, we have to be optimistic, and especially in, in uh, the current circumstances in the world. Um, it's very easy for each of us uh, to complain. Complaining is very easy to do, but um, just take a deep sip and, uh, and let's move forward. So in South Africa at the moment, you know, I've, I think with the drought, it's been ongoing for the last five years. I think winemakers, especially, and viticulturists and wine farmers that we work mostly with, that us, as the three of us, mostly negotiate on businesses, uh, those guys adapt as, as we grow and as climate change happens. Um, we're lucky enough that now, now, these days, farmers start to travel and they travel to Prirat and Tenerife and the Duro and, and they see how those people are. And people that farm in the Duro and Prirat and the warm area send their kids to South Africa. So I think it's an ongoing learning experience of, I think no one has it written down of how the world will adapt to climate change and, and wine. Um, economical, I'm, I'm not a a banker or a financial person. Um, I, I like to make wine and, and grow fruit and stuff. So on that aspect, I can make any comments, but as long as at the end of the day, people drink a bottle of wine, especially if it's a South African bottle of wine, I think we have to keep on smiling and push forward. I think take a deep sip might be my new life catchphrase, Lucas. <laughs> Just take a deep sip. <laughs> That's definitely a way to live, I think. Um, thank you so much. And um, Peter Allen, anything to add to those comments? Yeah, I think just briefly, um, you know, South Africa is a fairly idyllic place to grow vineyards and, uh, and to make wine. And, um, but it's a very challenging place politically and, and with our history, you know, so I think that's almost for me causes me a lot more stress than uh, you know than the weather um and i think that that our history gives us a richness it gives us um you know 
yeah, just layers of complexity, uh, societal, you know, in the wine industry itself, um, that one must use, you know, to add to that richness. Um, but it, yeah, it's just, you know, I think with, uh, um, politically there, there's, there's a few dangers uh, in terms of holding onto farms and, and that kind of thing, which is, is by far much more stressful than anything the weather can throw at us, you know? So, um, yeah, let's just, those things are unfortunately, you know, to a large degree out of our hands. Um, and we've got to, we've got to see where that goes. Um, yeah. And then obviously a certain, uh, you know, certain viruses that are floating around the world at the moment. <laughs> A little, uh, you know, adding a little to our, to our stress, our stress levels. But um, yeah, we've just got to put our heads down and and do what we can. You know, I think that's uh, uh, something that everyone has to try and uh, try and work out in their lives, um, and particularly during these times. Well, thank you all for sharing. Really, um, I think that's moved quite a lot of us. Actually, um, certainly some people on the chat. Um, really honest, open, um, and very much appreciated by members. Um, but I think it's time to, to talk happy things. I think it's time to talk specifics on wine. Uh, so I'll go through each of you, if that's all right, and ask you a couple of specifics we've had from members. Let's start with you again, um, Peter Allen, if that's OK, because we'll go yep. through in order. Um, we have had Lisa Harlow has asked, will Peter Allen move to other varieties or leave that to Gabriel, Gabriel Skouf as he makes the best Cab Franc in South Africa? So any other varieties on the horizon, Peter Allen? Well, I am, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I am also the winemaker at Gabriel's Cliff, so that- I think that's uh, what she meant. <laughs> that fact that I'm making, and uh, yeah, we, Syrah is the other thing that we focus on there. Um, I make a Souvenir Blanc in Amphora now that I'm, I'm super excited about. Um, you know, we, we make a, a, a Bordeaux style blend that, that's uh, fairly entry level and easy drinking called the blend and that's got all the Bordeaux varieties so there's we make old vine shin and so there's very few varieties that I don't work with um, and I just I, I'm, I'm fascinated and, and just incredibly curious about wine and about making wine and um, I love the fact that, that I've got this opportunity at Gabriel's Club to work with other varieties and um you know just sort of try and satisfy that, that curiosity you know i think i have to kind of rein myself in from releasing a, a brand new wine every year just because there's you know in south africa it, it's limitless with what can, one can do and and i love the whole process of name creation and and labels and and all of that you know just it really sort of feeds my soul um but the one thing that gabriel's cliff does do is kind of satisfy that side of things so i don't experiment too much with Kristallum and kind of keep it, you know, I think it's important that, that, that Kristallum has that focus on Chardonnay and Pinot, um, you know, so, but yeah, it, you know, it's worked out well. Fantastic. I think that might answer this question, but I'll just double check in case there's anything you want to add. Christos has asked, what's the main winemaking differences you have between the two brands or the two wines or wineries as it were? Yeah, you know, the, the winemaking focus, like I mentioned earlier, is, is really simple. You know, even with our, um, you know, we make a Sauvignon Blanc, uh, you know, at Gabriel's Clough that we do sort of 50,000 litres of, but it's 100% natural ferment now, you know. So, um, yeah, I, I've tried to almost like move everything towards a, a very, very simple, straightforward winemaking philosophy and focus on the vineyards. You know, we, we've got uh, Rissa Kruger, who's uh, our consultant now at Gabriel's Clough, um, you know, and I think winemaking can kind of get you to a, a certain level, but the, that last little 5% that really matters, um, that's comes from the vineyard, you know, so that's where all we've been mulching, we've been, um, you know, pulling out some vineyards, planting some new vineyards, you know, we've really been focusing on the vineyards. Um, yeah, so that's, that's where the focus is and, and almost simplify the winemaking as much as possible every year. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Cool. Uh, Lucas, let's jump to you if that's all right. Um, I'm going to combine a few questions. We've had an, actually an awful lot of people asking about aging. Um, so Robert has asked about aging the South African Shenins. Um, we've had Phil and Robert ask about aging the Breton. I think it sounds like quite a few people want to keep hold of your wines. How long would you recommend and what um, evolution will you see if you do hold on to those wines? Yeah. That's a very good question. I think that's 
what a lot of importers ask when they start importing new uh, producers. I'm going to start with something. I think it's probably a, a, a side uh, line to your question. The, the first time I went to the UK um, presenting my wines, which was quite intimidating because I was standing in a room with the likes of Peter, Peter Finn and Sam and Yibin and Ardy and all those guys. And it was probably two o'clock the afternoon and um, I was getting tipsy because you don't get to eat a lot because there's all these hordes of people coming to taste your wines and uh, and you don't have the time to eat food. So you just keep on tasting your friends' wines, which were fantastic wines. And it was probably half past two, three o'clock and I saw Stephen Spurrier uh, coming clockwise tasting stuff and growing up he used to be like what he's done in the wine industry and back then we only did four wines uh, Break a Leg, Geronimo Camaraderie and Breton and um, he tasted through my wines and uh, he wasn't full of words and stuff and he said like for all the stuff it's pretty nice or good and then uh, we ended up with Breton 2016 um, and um, he put his hand on my shoulders and I'm pretty a big guy so he looked up like standing on a ladder and he said uh, "Can may, may I have a word with you and I'm like shit I probably poured him a corked wine and uh, I walked away with him and, uh, and he told me I just want to say thank you and I said for what sir and he said that reminds me of the law from the 70s and and when you when you when you taste the, the Loire Carbonet Francs from the 70s, uh, they don't have massive wood or uh, it's just the, the, the varietal and, and the way they age. And, and I know Finn loves Carbonet Franc from Gabriel's Cliff and, um, and the way I do it is proper Thierry Germain, like Le Memoir, 100% old bunch. And when those wines age, and when, and when you guys taste the, the Breton 18 or 19, that's from Wine Society, um, those wines are, are grown on granitic soils. So they, they have this load of energy. It's like a, a young international rugby player trying to impress the coach with these massive experienced rugby players around them. Um, those wines are unbelievable to drink when they're young which Carbonet Franc does. But when you're patient enough, five years along 10 years, they start losing that herbaceousness and, and then you start getting that proper red, black fruit, blue fruit and spiciness to it. Shannon wise, I don't think I'm the best Shannon guy from South Africa to speak about it. Um, I love my Shannons. I've opened a Camaraderie 2016 the other day, which tasted like it just came off the bottling line, but um, I think the newer generation, the way they make their Shannons or white wines in general, uh, you can ask Sam and Finn who makes fantastic Chardonnays. We make our wines much more oxidative like they did in the past. So you can, our white wines age beautifully. Um, we have fantastic tannins and concentration due to the dry, but luck luckily we don't have any control in that. Um, I think the great thing is at the moment is when you buy a proper South African wine, you know that it, it took a hard fought concentration and thought and planning to produce that bottle of wine to get it there. Uh, from the farmer, from the farm worker to get it there and the winemaker, um, yeah, that's my thing. Um, I think the great thing is let's do a thing and everyone just buys 10 years of Lismo Reserve Vionier and let's do a virtual tasting and see how they age. Because um, the thing is we don't have a massive backlog like Burgundy where we can say this is how South African white wines age. But from, from my perspective... I know these things will age for, for years to come, so. Perfect. Thank you. Yes, um, that's often a challenge we get with the newer world 
you know people often ask how long and it it's sometimes impossible to say but you know to trust your gut and suggest that this wine these wines will age I think is great I definitely think um having tasted it it seems like so it's definitely got the structure to age love the rugby player analogy <laughs> um fantastic thank you I am going to pop to Sam now I think um now Sam I apologize if this is a controversial question um but Roger Bevan has asked why has Lismore decided not to present wine to platters and for members that don't know platters is a um sort of guide written for um it's a very extensive South African guide but I didn't actually know, Sam, that you don't feature. So could you explain to members why you've chosen not to? Um, it is a very controversial question. So I, I probably won't go too much into it, but um, you know, we all choose to, to um, participate in... <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> I'll choose to participate in 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 whatever we choose to participate and and for um, just you know from the beginning there were in the early years there were issues of timing and um, and there were also issues I think in my early years of style I I felt very strongly that they wouldn't that that the tasters at the time wouldn't appreciate. Um, the style that I was making and now the style that I make has become very trendy. Um, but I, I sort of had moved on by then. Um, it's not a political statement against platter by any means. It just, um, I, I, I feel, I, I, there, there are, there are palettes around the world that, that I, um, that I really value their feedback. Um, and, and, and it really informs my winemaking you know, um, there, sometimes I think you didn't never ask a question that, that you're not all that interested in hearing the answer to. And so if there's a palette, let's say that really appreciate 16%, you know, and I'm not, I'm not saying platters one of these, but I'm just giving you an example as a winemaker and the kind of decisions we might make. So if there's a, if there's a palette that appreciates 16% alcohol, Pinot Noirs that are really extracted in lots of wood, and you know you don't make that wine, you know, you may not submit um, to that critic because you're, you actually don't care what they think. That's not the wine you're trying to make. And so um, with Platter, I just over the years kind of didn't submit and I just still don't. But it really, don't don't take it as a, as a um, indictment of Platter. It's more, it's sort of been 18 years without them and, um, and I carry on. Um, that's all. Okay, next question. <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> I think we lost Anna. Were there any questions, Joe, that you wanted to ask? I think we may have lost Anna for a moment. Yeah, we, we have temporarily. Sorry about this. <laughs> no, no, no problems at all. Um, Tell us how is the 2021 vintage looking? How are you feeling coming into uh, into the new season? Obviously, a little bit better with the when you can have a glass of wine at the end of the day. How are the vineyards? Um, yeah, I'll chip in quickly. Uh, I'm not sure yet. I think right. it's um, the vineyards are looking great growth wise, um, but it's been cold. It's been a really kind of cold. Uh, you know, fairly wet winter, which has been you know, amazing for the soils, amazing for the vineyard reserves. Um, but yeah, it's still, it's a very different vintage from the last six. Um, you know, so I think it's, I think we're going to have great acidities, um, but the disease pressure has been a little higher. And I think the challenge this year is to kind of, is going to be to have the same purity that we've had um, the last three or four years, you know, so it, it feels like a, a cooler climate, um, almost European harvest that we're going into, you know, so one's just got to get your head around that, I think, and I'm sure the, the wines will be, um, you know, should be really, really good, and, we, we, you know, we have to make sure that they are, um, it'll just be a, a different set of challenges. Yeah. yeah, and when would you expect to start, Peter? Um, I expect to start on Monday. Oh, very soon then, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So we're about ten days later than usual in the Himalayan Ardo. Okay. Um, yeah. So pretty pretty soon. And Sam, your kind of similar sort of location. So you'll you'll be facing similar similar timetable, or are you a little bit later still? Uh, I I'm definitely later still. Um, it's been really really interesting this year. Um, it's been you know literally since the fire, it's rained and. The one thing you learn as a farmer, especially a dryland farmer in South Africa, is never, ever curse away the rain. And yet um, it's been very wet, very green, and for that reason, and very cool. And so I, I wanted to replant some of the burned vineyards, and, and I actually couldn't even put in the bulldozer in because the soils were so wet in the winter. And, and now in the season, we just have so much moisture. It, as Peter Allen said, there's disease pressure. We're managing it. Um, but yeah, things are late. You know, to give you an idea, I, I'm so much later than the rest of South Africa that traditionally, up until 2014, I always picked my first pick of Chardonnay on the 3rd of March. And like literally people in Robertson are picking early mid Jan. You know, I'm like two months later than the than the earliest guys, um, and at least a month later than Stellenbosch. And yet, 2015 was the craziest year because the entire South African harvest moved up a month and caught everybody off guard. And ever since then, we've slowly marched a little bit later to traditional dates, but we are we we are now in in like our. our our calendar has been shifted. And so I actually think this year is going to go back to kind of the first 10 years of me harvesting no normal dates, but it feels crazy late. And every day is a day that the birds can take your fruit, the day that the baboons can take your fruit, that, that mildew can take your fruit. It's, it is much easier to pick earlier, I must say. It is, it's cleaner, it's, it, you just feel so much better as soon as that fruit is off. like. <laughs> you can breathe and and right now we are all just sitting and waiting um even in the warmer climates like where lucas works and and it's 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 uncomfortable for all like okay enough enough already let's get the fruit off yeah mm -hmm. yeah and, and look, <laughs> you were saying you're 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 you two are very close to starting is is it you're facing similar, th even if you're in a different location, you're facing similar challenges. Yeah, I totally agree with Sam. It's uh, it's unbelievable the, the the new generation. I think the last six years um, with the ongoing drought, I think we've now been formatted. I think everything is now back to normal. Um, in Stellenbosch, normally the guys. Don't plan because this year Easter weekend is early April, and and so normally winemakers that are, are making carbonate don't plan their their Easter weekends because you have to be at the cellar. And I think this year it's finally back there again. Um, it, it's the, the growing season so far reminds me a lot of the 2014 vintage, um, uh, mm -hmm. a bit cooler, wetter, and. I love when you drink now the 2014 vintages from uh, a great a winemakers, uh, they, especially the white wines, they're the ones that for me still have great acidity and tightness and freshness and focusness on it. Um, so I'm lucky enough that I make some wines for other people, even from the Northern Cape. Um, so I have like a broad spectrum and from, from the whole country. But my top stuff from Stellenbosch is at least 10 days later uh, from the, the Paderberg and Swartland, seven, eight, 10 days later. Um, and it's funny enough when you start going in, in, in this global warming area or, or, or period, uh, you, it, it's quite easy to get captured in this is the normality. But I think like Sam mentioned, um, I think this is probably what, when we grew up as in, in a wine growing community, this is what a normal harvest would like has to be in, in Stellenbosch and, mm -hmm. and so on. So for me, 
there's like Finn said as well, the, the disease pressure has been quite high in Stellenbosch, but that's typical normal Stellenbosch. Um, we had a, a bit more rain than, than the last few years, but not as the average would expect. Um, um, we did a few little bit of parcels, but only to wet the cellar. So next week, Monday, um, it's, it's a serious business and um, we're looking forward to it. Um, it's just funny enough how the last three uneven vintages are the more fresher, cooler, brighter vintages, uh, according to me. So. Okay, thank you. And I see you're back. You, I don't know how you're going to choose between the questions, but I'll let you um, <laughs> make that tough decision. Yes. Oh, no, I think we've lost her again. Apologies. Yeah, we seem to have lost her again. OK, that means I get to ask one of my questions. So if you compare, if each of you, if you compare when you started out and, and what inspired you to, to start out back then, could you do the same again? Are, there, are we going to continue to see the most fantastic um, new additions to the, to, to the industry or are we in a very different place now? COVID aside, clearly, because you know that anyone starting a business now would be uh, would be very brave. But is it something that you that could happen again, Lucas? You're still there. What do you think? <laughs> sure, I was hoping you were going to start with Sam or Finn. Um, it's um, I think we my my old Van Ochemer is still a fairy tale story. Um, I had this epiphany moment in 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 the Bourguet and um, fantastic friends who helped us to get here. I don't know if we did it today or over if we would get here where we are. We are just lucky, and I think stars aligned that we work with fantastic farm producers, viticulturists. That each of each of my grape growers have had too much wine around my dinner table and we get along so well. Um, and we've been blessed. I think the, the global wine community is so small. Everyone, I don't know if it's really a small community. Everyone knows everyone and everyone helps everyone. Mm -hmm. And for me, another great thing is like old Sam's old uh, catastrophe that happened and how she rebuilt it within 12 months. It's unbelievable. So I think there are, if you if you truly believe in what you want to do, and if you have a great support structure, and and you have people that believe in you, and you believe in people, and you believe in what you want to do, you'll you'll rise to the occasion. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's exciting times. I don't know the last eighteen months, 12, 16 months. It's difficult to make predictions, but. Uh, from a South African, I think we're making some of the best wines in the world. And uh, you know, thanks to thanks to the UK and people like you, Joe, um, I think we're going to keep on going, punching upwards. Well, certainly, cheers to that, Peter Allen. Any any thoughts as to if you were to be back there again, would it could it be a similar similar thing? Um. Yeah, it's difficult to say. You know, I think in in those days it was um, fortunate that I got going kind of just at the start of the new wave and and sort of was able to to ride the wave. Um, excuse me. <laughs> um, uh, you know, as it was really really starting to pick up momentum. Um, you know, but there also wasn't quite the market for South African wine that there is now. You know, so guys that are coming into and there are people coming into the industry every year. You know, so. Um, there's much more, I think, um, appreciation of South African wines. And, you know, my importers are, are uh, across the globe are looking for new South African um, producers. You know, I think that there's much more kind of almost competition now to, to sign the, the right producers. Whereas when I started, you know, we would go to the UK and guys would come and taste with you and they would sort of M and R about it. And they're you know, not sure we can sell, you know, Chardonnay at this price. And, 
um, you know, I, I was almost, I think, very, very lucky to to get with a, a good importer at uh, at that stage, you know. Um, so it's it's certainly more expensive. Grape prices have gone up a lot um, since I started, which is a, which is a very good thing. It's let's say a lot for the right, for good vineyards uh, in the right areas, not across the board. Um, and there's a lot less old vine shinen um, to access, you know, which is also a good thing. I think that those those classic, you know, kind of beautiful old vine shinen vineyards um, are generally spoken for and are be looked after really, really well. But it's a lot harder for a new producer to kind of come on board and say, okay, I'd, I'd like two tons of of 40 year old Chin and Blanc, where can I get it? You know, it's, it's going to be difficult to find now. So, um, yeah, difficult in some ways, but but also easier in other ways. We've, uh, my assistant at um, Gabriel's Clerf is bringing out a new wine. My assistant for Cristalum is also bringing out a new wine. And, um, you know, we've, we've got a French guy that helps us make a bit of a bit of our bubbly at Gabriel's Clerf. And he's got a project with John Seckham. And, you know, so there's, South Africa is still an, an open place, an easy place to be able to to come up with a, with a new wine brand, and and uh, yeah, long may that continue. <clears throat> Fantastic, and and Sam, for you, are are you still wine of origin, Grayton, or have you got any uh, any neighbours these days? Um, there are some small plantings in Grayton um, that are more hobbyist. I think right now the price of apples is too strong. I think it makes a lot more financial sense for, for my neighbors to grow apples. Mm -hmm. But but the one thing I wanted to say about then and now, um, and for those of you, because I've been watching some of the comments that are new to South African wine, I'm, I'm actually significantly older than, um, than Peter Allen and, and Lucas. And you know, when I came into this industry, as I as I joked, it was still very kind of the, everybody was making what you would expect from South Africa, um, and it was like California style. That's that's why I kind of slotted in and planted what I did, and um, and what I can tell you is that anyone coming into the industry now, the industry is totally transformed. There is a connection to Europe. There's a connection to the rest of the world. It's not just Europe. It's Chile, Argentina. New Zealand, Australia, we engage with winemakers from all over the world and, and anyone starting up a business the way that the three of us have is starting from a completely different base. And, um, and the things that are happening, I, they're exciting, yes, anything new is exciting, but they're also relevant, you know, um, and, and I think you can trust that the wines coming out of South Africa, especially if a, if a reputable importer and, and wine society is bringing them in is something definitely to look at. So, so there was a learning curve in my beginning years. I, I bought in 2003, I was making wine in those years. And I think South Africa really started to kind of click in 12, 13, 14, and then it like hit. So, so any producer, young or, or middle-aged, um, picking up now, but especially the youngsters um, who, who are making wine all over the world, engage with winemakers all over the world. I mean, look at what we've done tonight. You know, we can engage with anyone. I can ask anyone any question at any time and get an immediate response. And so um, the quality coming out of South Africa, especially in the premium and is, is, is world-class. And, um, and I, think, I think anyone starting today has that advantage. They don't have the learning curve that, that I had. Um, Peter Allen was, was a little bit like mine. Um, and Lucas started from the lore. So he just like launched. <laughs> um, but yeah. I think I think um, just look for anything that Wine Society puts out, but but the new stuff is exciting and and it's really cool. So um, yeah, that's my final parting well, words. I I have to say I'm 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 totally with you. There are so many fabulous wines coming out of South Africa, and members are always asking why aren't you doing this wine? Why aren't you doing that? Why don't you have more South African wine? There's too much good stuff. Um, I, we can't do everything. We have to have some some kind of organisation. But having said that, I am just so delighted that we are working with you three guys. Um, it's a privilege. Um, love tasting the wines each year and we'll look forward to continuing to taste them, to taste the new things, 
uh, to visit the new sellers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, thank you all of you for your time. I know it's, um, it's much later in the evening there. So thank you so much for giving up your evenings, especially just before you, you launch into Harvest, which is your busiest time. Um, so I'm very glad that we managed to get in just before that. Um, and Anna, shall I hand over to you just for just just to close? But hey, thanks thanks so much to all three of you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Absolutely, thank you, Joe. Echoing your sentiments completely, it really has been a pleasure to have all three of you on tonight. Members have gone wild in the chat. Joe, I think you'll have plenty of um, emails in your inbox tomorrow about why we don't <laughs> stock more. It seems to be the running theme. But um, in all seriousness, the members this evening. Thank you for coming. Thank you for supporting South African wines and what we're trying to do here at the Tastings team. It's always a pleasure to have South African wine because on you always tell fantastic stories. You have an honesty and openness, um, and it really does make my job, other than the Zoom issues, incredibly easy to host these sorts of evenings. So raising a glass to the three of you, to Joe for being a fantastic host, to Gil and Catherine behind the scenes, and to all you members for joining. Thank you. Drink South African. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you so you. much for having us. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you.